We made it. We made it to the end of the Christ and the Cross series. After this week, we're going to be looking at Jesus through all of Scripture in December during the Christmas season. I'm really excited about that. Then once we get done with Christmas, we're going to be going into the book of 1 Corinthians. I'm super stoked about that personally. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead. I'm going to pray. We're going to recap. We're going to dive into it. We have a lot. I know I say this every week. We have a lot to do today, guys. I, I, I'm not kidding. The topic we are hitting today has been something that has been, has been my muse and s- since I came to faith in Christ. I'm not even kidding around about that. I'll tell you a story here in a minute. But This has been one of the things that has been my passion, has been something that has spurred me on and basically dominated my entire life since coming to Jesus. So I'm going to go ahead. Let's pray. Let's recap where we've been and where we're going. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that by your grace, you save us. Lord, we thank you that you set us and your death produces things and accomplishes things like our forgiveness, our redemption. Lord, uh, you lived the life we couldn't lead, died the death we deserve to die in our place and for our sins. You give us a new life, new heart, new family. And Lord, today we're going to be looking at our new mission. So Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross. Let your people hear your words, nothing else. And Lord, spur us on to love and good works and the mission of God. It's in your good name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So throughout this entire series, let's see where we've been. And then we're going to kind of cap this off with one of my most favorite. I'm not even, I'm not kidding around about this. So we started here with a recap where we've been. We've seen penal substitutionary atonement. We've seen our reconciliation with God, our redemption and freedom from sin. We were enslaved to sin and then Jesus freed us. He cleansed us from this sin, uh, from our sin, from the sins that we've committed and the sins that have been committed against us. He washes us clean. We seen a couple weeks ago that we get a new life in Christ. When you come to faith in Jesus, everything changes. You get a new heart, new mind, new everything. And we seen last a couple weeks ago we get a new family. You get a new family, new family in Christ. You get new new father, new brothers, new sisters. Everything changes. And one of those things that we're going to be discussing today is something kind of birthed out of that, which is our new mission. Now, I want to point this out about the mission of God. I have been fascinated and loved this phrase, uh, mission of God, this missio day. I like the way the Latin phrases it, where it's the mission of God, that we are on mission for the story and glory of God. Now, I'm going to be honest here. I think this doctrine needs to get, this concept of mission needs to get into the very DNA of who we are and what we do as a people. We need to see ourselves not as, not as just Americans, but as missionaries, not just as Christians, but missionaries in a place for a purpose to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, if you're sitting there in your chair and you're like, hey, I'm on mission already. I'm really excited. I think of myself as a missionary. Um, This is a good reminder. This is a good reminder to our souls because there is a billion things, right? There's a billion things right now vying for our attention. There's a billion ways in which we get busy and we get off mission. And there's this thing called mission creep right? There's this thing that we slowly, we're going one way, we're going one way, and then we kind of get bumped and go a different way. This is what happens. This happens with everyday life. I experienced this yesterday. Let me explain. So my weekend was crazy because yesterday I spent six hours fixing uh, a back wheel bearing on my van that started screaming at us when we were driving home from my in-laws. That was going in my mind and fixing brakes. And when we were going to my in-laws on, on, uh, on Thursday, the battery died in our car. So it's just been one thing after another, the, the billions of things that take my attention away. What we should be doing, brothers and sisters, is keeping our eyes focused on the cross 
and then thinking of ourselves as missionaries. Amen? So I want to ask this big question of how did the death of Jesus give us a new mission? How did the death of Jesus give us a new mission? Well, the new life, the, 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 the death of Jesus giving us a new mission is baked into and a byproduct of the new life that we have in Christ. When we come to Christ, we get a new life, new family, new purpose, new purpose in Christ. Most people are walking around asking, what, what are most people asking? What is my purpose in life? What on earth am I here for? What is my purpose in life? People are trying to find this out. I was reading, um, I was reading through catechisms this week because we do this, I do this with my children. I ask them questions and then we'll do this if we got five extra minutes because I'm trying to, the, I'm trying to make sure that they understand theology. One of the questions I found, which is the first question of the Westminster is what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. This is our purpose. Our purpose was to know God, love God, and be on mission for him. Now, I want to define the word mission, right? We have to, we can't just assume the same terms here. So what does the word mission mean? Well, I did a little, entom little, little entomology of the word. Mission comes from the Latin word missio, which means one who is sent. One who is sent. Well, there's a cognate in Greek that comes from the word apostolos which means to a delegate, messenger, one who is sent forth with orders. This is the same word, guys. We get apostle, like the 12. Now, I want to be very clear here. I do not believe there are big A apostles like the 12. Like if you believe there's an apostle, you're at the wrong church. We don't, we don't, like there's no big A apostles. But there are little A apostles that are gifted, especially gifted on mission for starting things with the gospel. Like church planting, for example, would be someone that is gifted like an apostle. Not big A, little A. This is like church planting. And I'm going to be straight with you guys. Before God brought me here sovereignly, that's what we were looking to do. We were looking to go plant in Ann Arbor, go into a rough area for the gospel with a lot of paganism, a lot of all kinds of nonsense going on there. And I'm like, hey, this looks like a good place for people to meet Jesus. Why is that? Because that's what we do. We go and we share the gospel with people. Now, defining the mission of God. And I'm going to put all this together to give you a summary of the Missio Day, what the Missio Day is. One who is sent on a mission for the kingdom of God in fulfillment of the great commission. Note, when we say mission of God or missio Dei, we are using these terms synonymously. Synony synonym, the same word, same meaning of the great commission in response to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at this in scripture. Let's look at Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Let's read our text and then we'll pick it apart like we always do here. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Now, I want to give some context here of this text because the text without context, the pretext for a proof text. That just rolls off the tongue. Now, context. So what's going on in this book? This is after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus is meeting on the mount in Galilee to send his disciples out. To send them out on mission for the story and glory of God. This is one of the last things that Matt, this is the last thing Matthew records in his gospel. And this is Jesus giving his great commission to his disciples to go. Go in his name and preach the gospel. Now, what's going on here? Well, we see the 11 disciples in Galilee on a mountain. Note, why is there 11? One's dead. Well, G Judas, who betrayed Jesus, hung himself. There's 11 disciples on here. And I find this, so what are they doing? 
Well, they're worshiping Jesus. And I think this is really comical because what does it say that what they were doing after they were worshiping? Some doubted. Some doubted. Now, I love the fact that someone says that, that Matthew records this in his gospel. Do you know why? They had just seen the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection. They are standing in the presence of the risen Christ where Thomas was like, uh, you can put your fingers in his wounds. Like you can see Jesus and they're like, some doubt it. Now, I want to point this out just as like a side note. Just because you see great movements of God, just because, like, we think sometimes in modern American society in the 20th century, if I would have seen miracles, it would have been easier to believe. No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. We have the perfect word of God. Brothers and sisters, we have a gift that Christians all over throughout history have died for and would have given everything to possess. We have to understand how privileged and how glorious and how much of a blessing this is. Now, that's just a side note, but I do also want to point out that if somebody to struggle with doubts is, not, is sometimes normative. To struggle with doubt sometimes is sometimes normative. These were the, these were the 12, these were the 11 left over. These, some of these people were struggling with doubt. So if you're here today and that's you, you're in good company. Now, I want to look at the words of Jesus and kind of camp here for the, pretty much the remainder of the sermon of what Jesus says to his people. So what is Jesus saying? Well, he says in verse 18, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. So what does he mean? What is he saying? He is sovereign over everything. All authority, heaven and on earth, everything. There is no higher authority than Jesus. He is king of kings, Lord of lord. There are no earthly kings or rulers or anyone that is higher than Jesus. Note, this is extraordinarily important when it comes to us being on mission extraordinarily important for us when we're on mission for the gospel and in fulfillment of the Missio Dei and the great fulfillment. So why is it important for the mission of God? Why is Jesus' authority so important for the mission of God? Well, the gospel will challenge all earthly authority. The gospel will challenge all earthly authority. The gospel says that earthly rulers and kings are not the ultimate rulers. This makes them angry, typically. Now, the first Christians, believe it or not, were persecuted. You know, one of the first things that Christians were persecuted for? Any guess? Not being, so they had two phrases in, I was going to try to say it in Greek and then try to say like the two phrases, uh, Kaiser Kurios or Jesus Kurios. Caesar is Lord or Jesus is Lord. So in the first century, what would happen is their, their civil government was also tied to a religious form of government, right? So what would happen is you would say, uh, Caesar is Lord and then offer a pinch of incense on the altar. That's like your tax payment and you're good to go, right? You just, you offer the little pinch of incense, you're fine. You just, it's like paying your taxes, but that's recognition that Caesar is Lord. Early Christians could not do that in good conscience. And we said, Jesus is Lord. Early Christians were persecuted and killed for this. They were outcasts from society. They were looked at honestly as political dissidents. This made them enemies of the state because we did not, because we had a different allegiance than to the state, to the government. We have an allegiance to Jesus Christ. Now, the reason I bring this up and why this is important for us is governments will try to control the propagation of the gospel. Governments will try to control the prop propagation of the gospel. We saw this in 2020, right? We saw this a couple years ago when governments looked at churches and said, you're shutting down. And some churches like John MacArthur's church in California was like, no, we're not, come make me. And, and they threw our brothers and sisters in Canada in prison for this. Guys, this could happen here. 
This could happen here. We must raise the flag and say, Jesus is Lord over everything and have this impact our mission of God because we must have this firmly cemented because there will be temptation. Just be quiet. Don't say anything. You could lose your job. You could, you could, you could get, get fined. Just, just sh- sh- shut up. Just be quiet. No, shout it from the rooftops that he is king, that he is Lord, that you must repent. That's what we must be about, brothers and sisters. We must set apart in our hearts as Christ, that Christ is Lord. Now, I want to point this out. In some, we must be willing to go to prison and be willing to suffer the consequences to be faithful to God. It's not a question of if, but a question of when this makes us an enemy of the state. It's the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. Now, there's some good notes on this. There's some good notes that Jesus is Lord. And here's what they are. You know what the gospel is? It's unstoppable. The gospel is unstoppable. It's like putting, you guys ever see those like cool science experiments? My kids love these. Where they'll put water inside this like cast iron, like really tight box. And you know what they'll do? They'll throw it in liquid nitrogen and explode. That's really strong metal they're putting water in. And the water just, the, the, the met, no matter what, the metal cannot contain it. No matter how hard a government or anyone else would try to push Christians, they cannot contain the gospel. There are more Christians in China where it's illegal to be a Christian than there are people in America. The, the North Korea, the gospel is probably flourishing. In India and all the places where they try to push, push the gospel down, that, that it's, the gospel is flourishing. Just think about that, guys. The gospel is unstoppable. We will fulfill our mission. Now, that actually brings me to the second, second thing. We will succeed on the mission that we have been given. Let's not lose heart. We must not ever lose heart that, yes, things may look bad. Yes, things could look bad. Yes, th- we might be persecuted, but we will never be persecuted toward the end. We will win. Jesus said he will win. We know the end of the book. We know what Revelation says. Steve's going through it right now. See, we know what it says. We know he will come back and he will win and put all of his enemies at his footstool. Amen? This is glorious. Now, what does he say after this? After he has just said, I am fully in control, he says, go therefore and make disciples. Now, I want to break this down. I don't want to be pretentious here. I don't want to just say, hey, let's, let's look at every individual word in this. But I do want to highlight one word in verse 19 that is extraordinarily important for us. You know what that word is? Go. Go. Exactly. Go. Go. Do you know why the God, it says go? Go is an active word. Go gives the connotation of activity instead of passivity in waiting for people to come to us. This is the difference, brother, to use an analogy. This is like, so opening day, I went out with my brothers, Vince and my buddy, John. We went out hunting for deer. We ended up not getting one. We ended up getting a roadkill deer, which was awesome. I, they taste just the same. It's okay. But I know. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm redneck enough to where I don't care about eating roadkill. I'm fine. I got a duck story, which I won't share here. Um, There's a difference in hunting. There's two kinds of hunting that you can do. There's something called ambush hunting, which is what we were doing. You sit in a blind, you wait, you have a gun like Elmer Fudd, and you're just sitting here for hours and hours and hours and hours on end, waiting for an animal to come by so you can shoot it and eat it. There's another kind of hunting. There's another kind of hunting. It's called active stalking. Is active, like active seeking hunting, where uh, they do some like hunting shows, like Stephen Ronella does this. I don't do this because you got to walk like 26 million miles. You get up on a tall, you get up on a tall mountain, you glass around, you find an animal, and you try to get close and shoot it. You're actively pursuing something. This goal that we see here in this text is not the ambush kind of waiting for people to come to us. This is the active seeking that we must do in the gospel. Now, there's, I point this out. You know why I point this out? Really important. Because for far, far too long, the church is great, especially the church in America. We do this weird thing where we, we 
we categorize, unfortunately. We think going, we're good at going across the water. We're very good at going and sending missionaries to all places and peoples and stuff like that. But you know where we fail to go? Across the street. We fail to go across the street. We should actively be going to places where we can share the gospel. We should 100% actively be going places that we can share the gospel. Now, wherever you go, I don't know where you guys frequent. I don't know what clubs you're a part of, neighborhood functions you go to, family gatherings, what other places you go during the week. Do you know where your hunting ground is for the gospel? Do you know where your where place you share, the, the place you work at? You know where your place for the gospel is? Right there. That God puts you sovereignly where no one else, where he's not put anyone else so that you might share the gospel with those that are around you. Now, I'll give you two examples of this. I would go every year to my dad's family's Christmas party. There's not a lot of Christians in the, my dad's side of the family. There's just not. Like a lot of people that would be spiritual, a lot of people that, not Christians that I would say, yes, you've embraced the gospel. Yes, it's completely changed your life. I don't, like there's not a lot of them. So I would go every year to the family Christmas party and they had this like, this like Yankee swap, white elephant gift. You know what I'd throw in every year? Every year. I, I got a, a Bible. I'd put a Bible in there every year. So if you knew you were getting that one box, you knew we were getting a Bible. I remember one year, my, one of my cousins, a little cousin, grabbed the Bible and he was like, oh, it burns, oh, it burns, to which I respond, not as much as it's going to if you don't repent. <laughs> that didn't get me, <laughs> that didn't make me any friends that year. But it's the truth. I, I was there to share the gospel with my family. Like I was there. We're not, so we're close, but we're not super close. We're not seeing, I'm seeing them a couple times a year, maybe. Maybe a couple times every couple years. But we go just for the sake of sharing the gospel with them and going where they would frequent. I'll give you another one. This is going to be slightly controversial, but my, when I was in college, my pastor was the one that, that kind of helped me set this up and was really cool with me doing this. So one of the big problems, so many of you guys know, when I was in college, I was involved in this group called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Uh, most of my ministry has been geared toward men, seeing men come to faith in Jesus and then discipling them so that they would become strong men and then we'd change the culture because everything lives and dies on men taking responsibility. The reason why we're in such a problem now is because men have not taken responsibility in a good way. Amen? All right, so one of the problems I was having in college was guys wanting to come to church with me. Well, if I need to tell these people the gospel, I'm going to go where they're at so I can share the gospel. They would go to this one place in Ipsy called the Corner Brewery. Like there was a brewery pub in Ipsy. They served wings. And we would go on Friday nights. We would go on Friday nights. Uh, the guys that were there, we'd sit down and we'd have Bible study at the brewery. I know, mildly controversial. My pastor was like, hey, can I come? I was like, sure, come on, let's go, let's do this. And the non-Christian guys who wouldn't come with me to church are like, the church will fall down if I walk in the building. I'm like, no, it won't. But uh, you, I'll go to the pub with you and talk about Jesus. I'll go just about anywhere and talk about Jesus with somebody. That's the kind of the name of the game. So they would come and we actually seen people come to faith in Christ through this. We seen guys that wouldn't come to church, but they would come out to the brewery and They'd have a beer and some wings and have a, I'd give them a Bible and we'd talk about Jesus. I'm fine with that. Rock and roll. That's awesome. Now, with this, with going. So what are we going and what are we doing? Making disciples. Making disciples. I want to break this down. There's two components of effective discipleship here. Two components. There's evangelism and there is teaching. And these are inseparable. We cannot break these two, the two sides of the exact same coin. If you break down evangelism and teaching and you try to separate them, all kinds of horrible things happen. Now, with evangelism, I want to point out what evangelism is not first. 
Evangelism is not winning arguments with atheists and just showing how cool you are with apologetics and being able to mentally roast someone. That's not what evangelism is. Now, I point this out because I honestly fell into this trap when I was in college. I, fe- I read books on uh, apologetics and was super into it. I remember one year when I was in college, there was this atheist guy. My brother used to run the nerd club at, uh, at Eastern. It was called Archmage. It was this long acronym for Alliance of Comic Movie Hypertext. We shared a car. I had to go to this thing. Like I was stuck on campus and I'm like, well, I can either hang out with you or I can just, you know, go sit somewhere. So I was gonna hang out with my brother. So I was like, then we're gonna use this for the gospel. I was a new Christian. I remember there's this one guy there was an atheist. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know any, I didn't know nothing. I know jack about Jesus. I just knew I loved Jesus. This guy would twist me in knots apologetically. I remember being a baby Christian, just being like, this, this, is, this is horrible, guys. This is, this is me every week getting my face kicked in. I remember when me and I remember reading that summer, like three or four books and then coming back in the fall. And it was, it was not even a fair fight. It was not even a fair fight. We went, I made him eat his lunch. It was great. It it was like, (laughs) to keep up with the nerd reference, it was Goku going ultra instinct is what it was. (laughs) Now to point this back out, it is not, it, evangelism is not just winning arguments. Although I do want to point this out too. We need apologetics in evangelism. We need apologetics in evangelism. Do you know why? The goal of apologetics is not to win arguments, but to stop someone from suppressing the truth of an an unrighteousness per Romans 1. We're not trying to, we're not trying to just mentally win. We're trying to pry their fingers up off the truth that they already know. Everyone knows that there's a God per Romans 1. Now, what is evangelism? So that's not what evangelism is. What it, it isn't. What is it? The communication of the gospel and asking for a response. Evangelism, very simply, is communicating the gospel and asking for a response. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? You got you to know what the gospel is before you can share it with somebody else. The gospel is you're a sinner. You deserve, you're a sinner by nature and choice. You deserve judgment. Jesus died in your place and for your sins and he rose defeating Satan, sin and death. You know what the response you're looking for is? Repentance and faith. Turn away from your sins and trust Christ. I do this every week without fail. You're turning towards your sins. You turn toward Christ. You repent, you turn around 180 degrees. You embrace the gospel. You know, new heart, new life, new everything. We must communicate this message and then we must ask for, for a response. It's not, I think the, the, the second thing there of asking for a response from the gospel, people get nervous about. You know why people get nervous? We don't want to feel like, we don't want to feel like used car salesmen, right? You guys ever go to a used car lot? I went a couple times. <laughs> I typically buy my cars from people on like that I know or something like that because I don't like the high pressure sales of like car lots and plus I like the cheapness. So I'm going on a used car lot. The thing that bothers most people is the high pressure. You don't want to feel like you're pressuring. Let me just point this out. You're not pressuring somebody by asking for a response. You're not pressuring somebody. Ask for a response. Tell someone the gospel and say, hey, would you like to repent and follow Jesus and trust Christ? You're asking. You must ask. Now, I want to point this out also. This is really important. How do you share the gospel? Or how do you evangelize? How do you do this? How? There's one step that you got to do first. It's called die to yourself. You have to die to yourself first. You got to get used to looking bad in front of people. You got to get used to being hated. You got to get used to being avoided. You have to get used to feeling weird. And I got to be honest, the more you do it, the less weird you'll feel. The less weird you'll feel. The more you do it, the better you get at it. There's no, there's no shortcuts there. There's no shortcuts. You're not just going to be like, well, I'm going to learn all this stuff and then I'm not going to feel awkward. You're going to feel awkward. It's okay. Just share the gospel. Pick someone, even today. If you go to lunch or whatever, pick someone and share the gospel with them. Now, once you die to yourself, you look for opportunities. You look for opportunities like in conversations, for example. 
We, so one of the things that, one of the things that's hard, you know, the, one of the hardest things about being a pastor, I'm just be honest. There's no, like, I, I don't regularly interact with non-Christians. Like I could live my whole life ministering to people, just the, teaching Christians and not find lost people. I have to actively go look for lost people to go. I love doing this. I love going to like stores or whatever. And like, hey, let's strike up a conversation about Jesus. Like, go look for opportunities. Look for conversations. They will present themselves. I'll give you one for tomorrow. How many of you are going to work on Monday? No one's going to work on Monday? Y'all took like weeks off? This is crazy. (laughs) Someone's like, I'm not going to work on Monday. A week off, guy. Um, Here's the thing. What's the number one question someone asks you when you you come to work on Monday? How was your weekend? What'd you do? You can tell them you went to church. You can tell them you went to church. Hey, did you go to church this weekend? No, I don't go to church. Hey, why don't you go to church? Well, I don't go to church because, hey, do you know what the gospel is? Do you know what the message of church is? That Jesus lived the life we couldn't lead, died to death, we deserve to die. Hey, you know you're a sinner, you can get new life in Jesus? There's a perfectly wide open door. When I worked in finance, I milked that cow like you wouldn't believe. Every week, they're like, he's coming, he's coming, he's going to ask us how our weekend was and tell us about Jesus. Exactly what I'm going to (laughs) do. Every week, (laughs) probably twice. But here's the thing. You have to look for it in conversation. Look for it in your life. There's life events that people are more susceptible, more open to the gospel. Look for conversations. Look for events that you can go to and times in people's lives when they're receptive. I'll give you another example here. Funerals. Sometimes it's easier to talk to people during different events like funerals. Like when my mom died 10 years ago. I shared the gospel with more people in that week than I did the entire year before. Do you know why? They're confronted with death. They're confronted with death. In front, you're going to die. Hey, you know, you, you, hey, check this out. There's a, there's a corpse laying over here. We're all going to wind up there one day. Do you know what happens after that? You're either going to go be with Jesus or you're in, in, in eternity and it's glorious. Or you're going to go be with Jesus and, con- and he... Uh, where they're tortured in the presence of the lamb. Like, you're either going to go to heaven or hell. Let's choose heaven. Let's give you the gospel so that you might come to faith in Christ. Now, look for those opportunities. Look for people in your life, in your family. Then make opportunities. There's another thing we can do. We can make opportunities. A really funny quote by... uh, by Terry Crews. I didn't put this on here. I was doing this. Uh, life's a kid. Like you don't have to worry about getting a bigger piece of the pie. Life's a kitchen. You can make your own pie. I, lo- I love that quote. And one of the things that I love is like, you don't have to just look for opportunities. Yes. Pray for opportunities from God so that you could share the gospel with somebody, but we can make opportunities. Guys, you know that you can go downtown Plymouth and share the gospel with people. You can go to abortion clinics every Saturday and preach the gospel. I got friends that we're, we're, I'm God willing, we're going to start that here pretty soon. But I got friends that do that every week. They make opportunities and they go, they go find people. My buddy Gino set up a evangelism thing outside. This is, this is mildly controversial, but I think it's awesome. He, he, he was looking for the places that people was the darkest, right? Was the places where people would go. He went outside, like on the sidewalk of a strip club and was preaching the gospel to people going in now. Like, that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's preach the gospel from everywhere. Now, make your opportunities. And you know, finally, you know how you share the gospel? It's like the Nike commercial. You just do it. You just do it. You share it. You speak it. You need to use the words. You need to articulate the story. Romans ten seventeen. faith comes by hearing. There is no other way someone's going to get saved other than us giving them the gospel. There is no other way. And then you ask for repentance. You just, you share the gospel with them. Not in a weird way, not in a high pressure way. Just, hey, this is, this is Jesus. I set before you life and death, choose life. Now, whom should you evangelize? Whom should you evangelize? Well, we don't want to assume someone's a Christian. Never, never assume someone's a Christian. Just, I mean, going to church makes you a Christian just like being in a car, being in a garage makes you a car. Like it just, it just, it, that, that's just, just the truth. Like just because someone goes to church, like, oh, I went to church on Sunday. Doesn't mean they're a Christian. We're just putting that out there. Now, 
the other good thing too, especially when you're, you're evangelizing to someone and you're talking about the gospel, the good thing about talking about the gospel all the time is the gospel is both what saves us and sanctifies us. This is Paul in Romans telling the Romans, I am eager to go preach the gospel to you. You know what? Those people knew the gospel. Real spiritual maturity is not learning like, extra, the extra, extra stuff like eschatology or whatever. Real spiritual maturity is looking deeper into the gospel where we understand the gospel better. We're able to articulate it better. We're able to know it, love it, feel it. It it affects our heads, our hearts, then comes out to our hands. Now, so you should evangelize, whom should, should you evangelize? Everyone, your family. If you're a parent, the best person you can evangelize is your children evangelize your children. I'm going to be honest here about the, the, the evangelism of children. Children are probably both the most evangelized people and the least evangelized people in the church. It's, it's the weirdest paradox ever. Here's what I mean. They're most in regards that most programs in church, in the typical evangelical church, are geared around women and children. They're the most evangelized, like they, 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 they hear the most Bible stories, they hear all the other stuff, but least in regards that if a child comes to these things, people assume that if a kid's parents are Christians, they've been evangelized and discipled at home. I can assure you, just from my experience, that is not the case. That is not the case. Just because someone grows up in a Christian home, you don't learn the gospel through osmosis, they need to have the gospel preached to them. And I'm going to tell you a cold, sad, hard fact. I'm going to level with you. Do you know the reason why kids walk away? The, the, the number one problem people have had with children in evangelicalism, probably for the past 30 years is what? Kids walk away from God when they're like 18, 19 years old, go off to college, just leave, leave, leave Christianity. Do you know why they leave Christianity? They weren't Christians to begin with. They weren't, kept, they weren't evangelized at home. They didn't have a real relationship with Jesus. And when they got out in the world, they went with the world. We need to actually evangelize our kids and not assume that they're saved. Not assume just because you grow up in a Christian home. I am actively evangelizing my child. I'm not perfect at this. I'm going to be honest. I'm not perfect, but I'm, strugg- I'm struggling and trying. I have actively evangelized my kids every day that, that I'm awake. Even today, I'm, I'm driving to church in the car. I got Caleb with me in the back. He's bouncing around like, like an excited Muppet back there. Like, woo! Eats too much sugar sometimes, but that's, that's, my, that's my fault. But the point is, Caleb, who loves you? Daddy loves me. What does daddy want for you? Daddy, you want me to follow Jesus. How do you follow Jesus? Uh, uh, he's five. So we've been over this time or two. How do you follow Jesus? Uh, follow him? Well, you repent, son. What does it mean to repent, daddy? It means to turn away from your sins and trust Christ. Do you want to follow Jesus? Of course I want to follow Jesus. Jesus is awesome. Okay, we're going to have this conversation forever. As long, I'm going to be pointing this kid to Jesus and all my kids toward Jesus as long as I'm alive. Now, you evangelize everyone, your coworkers, your neighbors, anyone you meet. And then after evangelism, this is important if we look at our text, that baptism comes after evangelism. Once someone is repented of their sins, they are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we practice something here at this church called credo baptism. We baptize believers. This is an opposed to what some of our friends would teach, or some of our even brothers would teach, the pedo baptism with the baptizing of infants. There's, this is a very complicated, sometimes complicated uh, discussion. But the main reason we don't do it is because babies can't make a profession of faith. Babies wet them. You don't have to wet babies. Babies wet themselves. No one laughed at that. Okay. (laughs) Baptism is the first step in obedience to Jesus. It is the first step in obedience to Jesus. Now, teaching, teaching. This is the other critical thing that comes in making disciples. The quote by Dr. Vody Bauckham, one of my spiritual heroes. The modern church is producing passionate people with empty heads who love the Jesus they don't know very well. Read that again. The modern church is producing passionate people with empty heads who love the Jesus they don't know very well. What content do we got to be teaching someone? 
Like everything, in our text, everything Jesus taught the disciples. What this means, what is that? It's the whole counsel of God, the Bible. You need to know what the books, each book says, what the content of scripture is. You shouldn't see kids go off 18, 19 years old, go to a secular university and get twisted like a pretzel by a Bible as literature professor. Seen it firsthand. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Actually the degree, but that's beside the point. Theology, everyone's a theologian. Everyone is a theologian. You're a theologian. You're a theologian. You're a theologian. I'm a theologian. Everyone's a theologian. It's just a question of, is it biblical? Is it biblical? Is it what the book says it is? Now we want to know who is God, what God does. And another thing I would throw on here is church history. We need to be, we need to know church history and we need to know where things come from and why. Most evangelicals have the farthest we can go back in church history is Billy Graham. Guys, we are connected to something much, 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 much bigger than we possibly could imagine. We're connected to great stories and our Christian forefathers, like the reformers. We've seen that last month in October. We're connected to the early church fathers, like Irenaeus, like Augustine. Those guys that paved the way and did a lot for us today. We stand on the shoulders of giants and don't know it. Now, whom should be discipled if we look at our text? All nations. What this means. This means the gospel crosses boundaries. Every boundary that you possibly could give us, the gospel crosses. It crosses ethnic boundaries. We go to different people who look nothing like us, speak a different language to share Christ with them. People spend years and decades learning another language just so we can go share the gospel with someone else. And crosses national boundaries. We leave our cushy houses. We leave our countries. We travel to a faraway place and we pour our lives out for the gospel. It crosses national boundaries. It crosses physical boundaries. We go across mountains and lakes and rivers and oceans and across the Arctic and snow just for the sheer purpose of sharing someone the message of eternal life. So what does this mean for us? Right? I mean, I've got a bus outside. We're all going to go on mission. It's going to be great. No one's signing up. I'm just kidding. But here's the thing. What does this mean for us, us locally here with the gospel, with this great commission? I'm going to steal a phrase that's, a, that's popular. Think globally and act locally. Think globally and act locally. Right? That was, that was the recycling craze of the 80s. Think globally and act locally. Do that with the gospel. So where do we go? We grow across the street. You go across the street to meet your neighbors. You know what? I snow blow my neighbor's driveway every year. When it, every time it snows, do you know why? Because it might give me the opportunity to share the gospel with them. I love them. I love them and want to serve them, and I want to be able to share the gospel. There was a man next door. Um, there's a bit of a language barrier with one of my neighbors. They're, I, I forget what country that they're, that they're from, but he didn't speak any English. Very little English. Super really nice guy. Really nice guy. He was outside like shoveling snow. He passed away, unfortunately, from COVID. But I remember I snow blowed his driveway and he looked at me, he tried to offer me money. I was like, no, 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 no. Friend, uh, uh, I'm a pastor. I love, I love Jesus. I'm, I was a seminary student. I was like, I'm a seminary student. I love a Christian. I love Jesus and I love you. He goes, Christ? Christ, friend? And he hugs me. It was the coolest experience ever. I don't know if he was a Christian or not. I was trying to share the gospel with him, but... But yeah, so we go across the street and you know what? We go across town too. You know, the nations come here. The nations come here. There is like, we can go, you can go across the nations in Metro Detroit. Metro, like, give an example here. Metro Detroit has the largest Muslim population outside of the Middle East. You can go to Dearborn. It's like you go to a different country. Seriously, it's right down the street. You can go share the gospel with them. All kinds of immigrants come here. Indian, Latino, like Chinese, Japanese, everyone comes here. You can go on a cross-cultural missions trip and not leave your house. Or you have to leave your house, but not leave your city in a sense. Like I'll give you another place. You know where you can go and, and meet people of different ethnicities and different nations real close? Randazzo's. Randazzo's. I buy groceries there because it's cheap and I can share the gospel. You can meet everyone at Randazzo's. 
<laughs> Even people at our church sometimes, we see, we see them walking around while we're shopping. You'll see me there occasionally. But you can go there and share the gospel. You can cr- cross the nations. There. Cross the nations. Randazzo. It's right down the street. Now, with the con- I want to conclude with this. My prayer for us as we look at the Missio Day, as we look at this mission that God has called us to, to share the, the, the gospel and think of ourselves as we would be missionaries and emissaries of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, my prayer for our church is that we would be so consumed with the gospel that we that we should reach and teach and make disciples of all of those around us. This would be in our DNA, that the Missio Dei, the mission of God, would be at the forefront of who we are and what we do as a people. So what this looks like, we'd be living on mission. We'd be living on mission. We'd think of ourselves as missionaries to, to a people, we have fresh eyes that the people we come in contact with, your coworkers, the people that you meet at the gym or wherever, those people you would see as a missions field. You would see yourself as a missionary and an emissary of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And yeah, it's going to be awkward at times. It's going to be awkward at times. You're, you're going to have to have conversations and hard conversations with people about Jesus. And yay, you're, you're lost and going to hell. And I love you. And I need you to hear this message. That's my prayer for us as a church. That we would, that we would be so consumed with the gospel. So consumed with the gospel. That we would be living on mission. That everything would be considered. That everything would be missions for us. We would think globally and act locally that we would use every, op- we would be looking for and making opportunities for the gospel. Amen. How glorious is this? So if you're here today with this gospel, this gospel, this good news that Jesus lived a perfect life, died a brutal death in our place and for our sins, let today be the day that you trust Christ. Let today be the day that you repent of sin You trust in the perfect work of our Savior and get new life, new mission, new family. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, I love love your people. Lord, I love your mission. And Lord, I pray that we would love your mission. We would love your people. And Lord, that we would grow in grace and knowledge of the truth so so that we'd be on mission. We'd be so consumed with who you are and what you've done for us at the cross that we couldn't help but tell people about it. Lord, bless us as we continue to worship you. It's in your good name. Amen.